Dr. Harold Podock is an old friend of mine. Uh, we go back on it pretty close to 30 years. Uh, we've been wandering around the world at different places together and sitting for hours on end at uh, meetings and uh, I mean he and I, I remember we were sitting on a board together in Las Vegas and 27 times I went to Las Vegas in three years for weekends just to sit around with uh, him and a bunch of other wonderful folks. And the reason why uh, he's an old friend of mine is because early on when I was uh, doing some work with the Department of Defense and wandering around doing a project for the Secretary of Defense, as a matter of fact, looking at new ways to think about the future, I ended up in some crazy place up in uh, uh, Colorado where they were doing a new science convention. and and. It's a whole different story on its own, but it just blew my mind because I didn't know what I was getting into, and it was just crazy UFO things and all kinds of plants that talk to you, and it, it was weird. And uh, you know what I'm talking about, clean back surface there, Tom, just can't believe it. And, uh, and anyway, I heard about this thing about remote viewing, and I had... Uh, and it was this deep secret program, right, that the government had to use psychics to spy on the Soviets and the Russians and other such people and so I had enough clearances and stuff and could poke around and knew how the system worked that I, I hunted up how and I don't remember even the details of how it all got together but anyway we hit it off and uh, we've been friends and been involved in uh, all things unusual for a, for a long time and the thing of course that brought us together in addition to remote viewing at the beginning was the, our, our mutual interest in the whole issue of UFOs and alien life and the possibility that there was a whole lot more going on uh, in this part of the galaxy than uh, most people understood. Uh, the importance of that uh, relative to the kinds of reasons why we all come together here, or at least I hope that you all come together here, is that we're in this middle of this extraordinary transition. Uh, and uh, there's a place 10, 15 years from now when it's a whole different kind of place that operates in a way different way. And part of the reason of that is because almost certainly human beings have started to integrate themselves into the larger community of, of, uh, of, of civilizations that, that live in this part of the galaxy. And the reason why that's going to happen is because of this man and some of his friends. Because they uh, represent uh, the opening uh, to this whole disclosure process that uh, about what the United States government has been doing under the table for a long time. And of course, they've been lying to us, telling us, of course, oh, we don't know anything about this stuff. But they did, and they were. And what Hal and his friends are doing are trying to put that on the table and make that part of the legitimate conversation that we all have and in the process facilitate this emergence and transition of, uh, of uh, humanity. He's a quantum physicist and you know done a bunch of stuff and he can talk to you more about it but it's just wonderful to have you with us. Thank you Al. Thank you John. Well, I appreciate your interest and the fact that you've come here, so uh, I'm very anxious to share uh, what I have to share. And as you'll see from my uh, message up here, backstory and forward story. There is a backstory about the government's involvement in the UFO, or we now call it UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena uh, Program. But there's also a forward story <clears throat> where some of us who have been part of that program have banded together to uh, try to get more data out for the public to have a conversation about. So I'm going to cover both aspects. Let me begin with a backstory. Uh, anyone who follows the UFO area knows that, you know, starting in 1947, we supposedly had the Roswell crash and whatever. And there are a lot of uh, people calling the Air Force and saying, I've seen something in the sky and so on. And the public pressure was so great that Project Sign was set up. 
uh, ran for 47, 48, to gather data from uh, generally the public about uh, what they were reporting to seeing. And that transmogrified into Project Grudge and finally into Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book, of course, was the longest uh, running uh, organization, ran for 17 years. <coughs> but in 1969, uh, Condon at the uh, University of Colorado uh, was asked to set up a program to investigate whether there's anything that we should be taking seriously in what the Blue Book people had found. And they came to the conclusion, no, there's nothing here. Uh, don't worry about it. Nothing worth following up on. And so basically, public knowledge about any UFO program ended there. And so if between 1969 and roughly now, if you sent something into the uh, Air Force Public Affairs Office and said, well, what are you learning about UFOs? What's going on? They said, oh, no, no, we shut that program down in 1969. Truth of the matter, however, is that the very memo that shut down the program, written by General Bolander, had down in the fine print of the memo reports of UFOs which could affect national security will continue to be handled through the standard Air Force procedures. So the truth of the matter is the programs continued and are continuing today. This has been very much under the covers, uh, separate, uh, not, 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 no media associated with this and so on, until December 16th, 2017, when suddenly there was a front page story on the New York Times talking about a program that had been going on called Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. <clears throat> we call it ATIP. And this was an absolutely amazing revelation. They had good sources. I was part of the program. Thought it would never see the light of day. And suddenly, there I am, even, on, on the New York Times. And of course, with that kind of uh, coverage, mainstream press, Washington Post, CNN, and so on, picked up the story. And suddenly, this big barrage of, of media publicity <clears throat> now, the thing to realize is that this was a game changer. The reason was that the kind of people who are now coming forward, which I've listed here, ex-Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who actually founded the program, top-rated F-18 pilots who were encountering what we call advanced aerospace vehicles, significant Department of Defense and intelligence community officials began to come forward because of what had been revealed <coughs> to answer questions. And so suddenly, this whole area via the media moved from being just the tinfoil hat crowd for news on a Friday afternoon when you don't have anything to write about, to suddenly, oh my God, you know, there's, there's something really going on. The actual name of the program was Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program, OSAP, <clears throat> but it went by Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, ATIP. So ATIP was a nickname and later on the actual name of, of the program. And how did this get started? <clears throat> this program began in June of 2008. The Defense Intelligence Agency was concerned about threat from advanced aerospace vehicles, crafts and drones of, of unknown origin. A congressional budget was approved to address the issue. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and uh, Senator Inouye from Hawaii and Senator Stevens from Alaska were the people who were basically in charge of black budget programs. So this was all done behind the scenes. The rest of Congress didn't know the program was being set up. So that, that's, how, that's how it got started. And once the news came out in the New York Times, you might think that, well, these heavy hitters are going to kind of run away and walk it back and whatever. Not at all. This statement by Reid, I think, summarizes the view of the major political players that were involved. 
That is, we don't know the answers, but we have plenty of evidence to support the questions. This is about science and national security. If America doesn't take the lead in answering these questions, others will. Well, the ATIP program had two concerns, two areas of threat that they were concerned about. The obvious one, of course, what are these things? Craft flying over the continental United States, and we don't know what they are. Possibly off-world, possibly uh, some other country has got advanced technology. What is this all about? Now, you might think that that would be the major threat. It turns out that wasn't the major threat they were concerned about. The major threat they were concerned about is future threat. What happens if a potential terrestrial adversary say the Russians or the Chinese or whatever, achieve some significant breakthrough and develop game-changing uh, disruptive technologies based on their evaluations of the phenomena or maybe from sensor data or from crash retrieved materials. That's what they're really worried about. Of course, that's what the intelligence community and defense establishment have to worry about. That's their remit. And while they should be concerned, uh, this is a paper or actually it's a giant report about that thick that we were able to get out of, the, out of the Soviet Union. This is all the way back as early as 1991. They have had a massive program in the black, just like we did, trying to figure out what this is all about. And this, this uh, report has tons of units and academic institutes and research institutes that were involved in assessing various aspects. So this, this was a big deal. And of course, the DIA and others in the intelligence community understood that that was going on. And so to give an example, which probably most of you have seen because it's been in the news a lot lately, the investigations of uh, the Nimitz carrier group operating off of uh, San Diego and on several occasions, uh, these advanced aerospace vehicles would descend rapidly from 60,000 feet to 50 feet above the water, hover, and then take off. I mean, absolutely astounding kinds of things. In one of these times, a couple of F-18s were launched from Princeton, USS Princeton, and vectored by overhead AWACS uh, planes to investigate and see what was this. Can you get eyes on? And so, in fact, uh, they got to where they were targeted to see if they could see something. And sure enough, one of the uh, F-18 pilots actually got a good view. Uh, the object was hovering kind of over the water, and he went right down to check it out. And, uh, <clears throat> and suddenly, phew, it took off to the horizon in a couple of seconds. I mean, he was absolutely amazed. What he described <clears throat> was that there was an elongated craft, sort of like a Tic Tac, you know, the kind of candy you, you can eat. Solid white, smooth, no edges, about 46 feet in length, about the size of his uh, F-18, uniformly colored, no appendages sticking out like wings or tails or whatever. They were stealthy. The F-18 radars couldn't obtain lock, but forward-looking infrared radar could track while it was stationary at lower speeds. Forward-looking infrared radar just picks up the heat signature. And so even though uh, there was no radar lock or whatever, I mean, it did have a temperature above that or the surrounding volume of space, and so it, it would stand out on a FLIR radar and appeared to demonstrate advanced acceleration aerodynamic propulsion capability zipping around. Navy Commander Dave Fravor uh, has been on the news and you can find uh, interviews of him, several in fact, uh, on the internet. He was the first pilot to actually get there and see what was uh, there to see. And, of course, he had a wingman who also saw it, and he had another plane who was watching from above. And there was this event occurring. 
He did not have uh, FLIR radar on his particular F-18. <clears throat> so when they landed back at the carrier, uh, he told the next flight of people going out, you know, I, I saw this thing. See if you can get out there and get a picture because you've got your FLIR radars uh, operational. And so on the second flight out, in fact, they did capture this picture. And I have to realize this is on infrared video seeing a heat signature. Now, if this were some kind of propulsion of anything we can imagine, like hot gases coming out the back or whatever, you would see that kind of a plume. And so the big mystery here was you just had the craft, and it was hovering, and it's not obvious what its propulsion system was. You see no evidence of it. So when they came back from their flight and they showed Dave Fravor this picture, he said, yeah, well, that's, that's basically what it looked like uh, when I saw it up relatively close range. Now, you might think 2004, I mean, why are we talking about things that happened a long time ago? It didn't stop. Over the decades, lots of views of this happening with the F-18 pilots. Uh, more recent times, 2015, 2016, you've got the carrier group, USS Roosevelt in this case, operating off the east coast of the United States. And they see the same things, actually interfering with their missions. There have been cases where a couple of F-18s are going along and phew, something disappears or zips through and disappears right between them. And so it actually became an air safety issue. And that's part of what led to some, some additional uh, publicity, I guess you would say. This is displayed on the web and in, in various uh, uh, TV shows, so I'm sure you can hunt it down and, and uh, learn about it. So we had FLIR displays recorded, they had detailed debriefs of the pilots, for example, Commander Dave Fravor. He had uh, like 12 planes under his uh, group, uh, 300 people reporting to him. He was a top commander of this Air Force uh, group. The key assessments were advanced aerospace vehicle, no known air vehicle in inventory of U.S. or foreign nation, low observable characteristics, stealthy, advanced performance, advanced propulsion capability to remain stationary, transition to horizontal vertical velocities far greater than any known aerial vehicle, and with no a little signature. So that's what the DIA had to contend with. So how are we going to figure out what's going on? So for this particular program, the latest of many programs, they put out a broad area announcement in 2008 and said uh, we want 12 potential threat areas to be evaluated. Lift, propulsion, control, human effects, human interface, armament, whatever. And so a request for a proposal went out to the uh, defense industry and the intelligence community. And DIA chose Bigelow Aerospace as a contractor to address the potential threat. Now some critics out there have said, now wait a minute, I mean Harry Reid was a uh, senator from Nevada and Bob Bigelow, as an aerospace person, was located in Nevada. Wasn't this just some kind of sweetheart deal? And the answer is no. I mean, Bigelow had already had a large program that he had put his own money into for years. In fact, John and I were a part of uh, being on his uh, science advisory board. And so it was actually the DIA chose Bigelow. They, they felt he would be the person who had the right go get him attitude and of course had the right kind of uh, technical environment behind him. 
So he set up a division of Bigelow Aerospace called Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies. We call it BASS. And of course, he's supposed to do all the things you'd expect someone uh, to do if you set up a program like this. Where I came into the picture is that BASS contacted me, contacted my organization, and asked me to collaborate as a subcontractor. Since with John, we had been on this advisory, science advisory board, uh, we had many years of collaborating, and I've been a science advisor to Bigelow Aerospace, so it'd be natural that, that he might think of choosing me. The particular area that I took responsibility for is based on this. There was a critical issue, as you can well imagine, in these deep black programs. It's difficult for contractors to obtain expert opinion on critical technologies because there's such high level security and there's compartmentalization. We call it stove piping. So you've got people at this desk, people right next door at that desk, and they can't talk to each other. And so, I mean, this, this really held back progress. So I was given the remit to try to break through this kind of issue. And so I was contracted to commission papers from experts around the globe. And since we didn't want to be in the position of going out and say, hey, we're trying to figure out this UFO thing, uh, you know, can you help us out here? I mean, the publicity associated with that in our black program would, would have been a disaster. So instead, I just simply went out to people and said, uh, uh, I'm doing uh, a survey. Where were your particular application or your particular interest in your particular technologies be in the year 2050 uh, as, as far as aerospace uh, industry went? And so if I wanted to know, well, you know, what do we know about invisibility cloaking? I could go to the super expert, even if he's over in Europe someplace, not revealing anything and say, well, can you write us a white paper on where's this invisibility cloaking technology going or whatever? So over a two-year period, I let out 38 contracts. I'm going to show you the 38 papers so you can judge for yourself how technically oriented this program was. As you can see, I mean, some critics out there said, oh, well, that program was just looking at advanced aerospace vehicles. Uh, I mean, in, in the sense of, well, what are the Russians going to do in a few years or whatever? But of course, if you, if you read between the lines and you see you're looking at warp drive, traversable wormholes and stargates, I mean, we're not looking for what the Chinese are going to make next year. This program was absolutely directed toward trying to address and solve, to the best of our ability, quote, the UFO program problem. Another set of papers. We were into looking at the forefront areas of everything. In case you have any IA, any resonance with people who say, well, no, this is just looking at advanced uh, uh, aircraft uh, production. Well, then how do you explain that we would had a whole program on evaluating the statistical Drake equation, which is an estimate of how many intelligent civilizations are there capable of technological advance in our galaxy? This is definitely a, a UFO program, a UAP program, as, as we call it. These papers were collected together and put out as a series of defense intelligence re reference documents. <coughs> they were put up on a special server called JWIX. As you see here, they were unclassified, but for official use only. <coughs> so contractors and defense officials, intelligence community officials, they could go, all go in and read these papers. Now, the DIA often does these DIRDs, as we call them, Defense Intelligence Re Reference Documents. Typically, a series of papers will go up for, let's say, a few couple of months or three or four months, and then they're taken down, replaced with something else. Our 38 papers turned out to be the hit bonanza. 
years went by and they were still on there being looked at every day, practically. So this was really quite a hit series because they're very advanced uh, technical, detailed uh, papers on all kinds of things that would be of interest in the community. So let me give you a couple of examples. We have one here called Metamaterials for Aerospace Use. I can talk about an open source sample, I can't talk about others. And many of you have probably, if you've seen various TV programs and interviews and so on, you'll know about this. <laughs> there was a sample that was sent anonymously by a military source. He claimed that his grandfather had been involved in a crash retrieval operation and had gotten some material from it. And so he didn't want to identify himself, but he, he sent it forward for analysis. That's what it looked like. It's a multi-layered piece of material. And Linda Howe was the one who got it and began shopping it around and uh, trying to get analysis of it. She's, she's really a stalwart person to try to find out about this. It had layers of uh, bismuth. The size of that is less than a human hair. Those are the black areas you can see through here. And then they were separated by layers of magnesium, which are the lighter areas. And so that's what the sample actually looked like. There's been a lot of controversy, a lot of discussion about this, because after all, here you see something that does look like it was in a crash. The thin lines were the bismuth lines. So, what do we really know about that? Chain of custody is non-existent. Providence is questionable. So for all we know, it could be a hoax. It could be a fraud. It could be some slag from a foundry floor, some factory. But nonetheless, it was an unusual sample. So we decided, okay, well, then, then we should uh, at least take a look at it, have an open mind. Early on, Linda Howe, the uh, researcher who, who had this uh, sample given to her by Art Bell, uh, went around to many uh, institutions and groups to try to get some analysis. First of all, a survey of academic publications, interviews with people from organizations involved in special materials and so on, even went to uh, archives of the national labs like Los Alamos or wherever, and nobody had any data on this kind of construction having been made. And then there was someone else uh, she went to and they tried to see could they, bond, could they just duplicate the material. In fact, they had trouble bonding the magnesium and bismuth layers together. So it wasn't clear exactly how you would make it. And then finally, in talking to materials experts, you say, well, let's just say somebody could make this. What would you use it for? And all the material scientists said, I don't have a clue. I, don't, I can't even imagine the reason for constructing something like this. However, what happens is a couple decades go by or more, and suddenly we have our whole science of so-called metamaterials has uh, been uh, coming into the fore and developing kinds of uh, stuff. And lo and behold, a paper gets published which says, you know, if you had a bismuth layer of just this size that happened to match what we had. And it was separated by magnesium layers of about the size that we see. This would have a very special property. This came out of metamaterial research. It was not directly associated with the material. So, <clears throat> It turns out this would make a terahertz waveguide. Okay, what, what is, what's terahertz? Well, you, you hear about megahertz and gigahertz in the microwave spectrum, and then you hear about infrared radiation. Well, terahertz sort of lies in that no man's land as far as technology development goes. Uh, above 
microwaves above gigahertz, but less than the wavelength of infrared heat. So it turns out that ordinarily, when you have a waveguide and you want to send a signal from one place to another, you know, you have a pipe, for example. And the pipe generally has to be about the size of the wavelength, a half a wavelength, for example. Well, in this case, there's a frequency band uh, around five terahertz, and the wavelength is a certain size. But turns out in this special kind of material, those thin bismuth layers would transmit those signals at 1 20th the size of the wavelength. And so that means you now have sub-wavelength waveguide effects. So what that means is if you want to transmit a lot of data at terahertz frequencies, and you usually can imagine a stack of waveguides to do it with, now suddenly you've got this whole thing micro-sized down, and uh, you can carry out your task. And it's only because of metamaterials being developed. Now, there were no metamaterials being developed back in the days when uh, the sample was found, that's for sure. <laughs> but anyway, so there's a possibility this has an important effect. So actually what we see here then, and this happens in, in many cases, you get a material sample, unusual characteristics, and you want to evaluate it. The method manufacturer is difficult to assess or reproduce, as it was here. Purpose of function not readily apparent. But then our own science advances on over the decades. And finally, we get to a place where we could imagine a possible purpose or function comes to light, which is what was the case here. We still uh, have this in the pipeline to do a lot of experiments on that haven't been done yet because we haven't uh, raised the funding for it. But uh, there, there's more to be done. Well, let me pick another one, space-time metric engineering. This is a mouthful. This happens to be the area that I personally was the leader on. The question is, can you account for what we're seeing based on known physics? And of course, all the pilots get back and say, oh my god, I can't believe these things. I mean, they're violating the laws of physics. They're standing still. They're taking off instantly. Uh, like, like they don't have any inertial mass. There's this, you know, we don't know how that could even be possible in principle. Well, that's fine for the pundits and the media and, and even the pilots to, to say. But the truth of the matter is, we can't account for them. We can't account for them. By taking an engineering approach to general relativity, Einstein's theory of general relativity. So what, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, all of our electronic devices, you know, this device I'm holding, your cell phones, the lights, whatever you want to say, are all using, equation, using electromagnetism. Electromagnetism has its uh, foundational equations, and uh, everything that we have is really built on the, what the equations predict. And that, that's a completely mined uh, area of, of science and technology. But when it comes to general relativity, Einstein's theory of general relativity, that's mostly been in the purview of uh, astrophysicists who are trying to figure out what happens when black holes emerge or whatever. Um, no one ever thought of taking the equations of general relativity, just like we have the equations for electromagnetism, Maxwell's equation, and say, well, suppose we could engineer those equations. Suppose we could build something based on those equations. This is textbook physics we're talking about, not, not fringe physics. So one of my jobs was then to make a list of all the weird anomalies uh, reported about these objects. Actually, from my standpoint, the weirder the better, because if somebody is making up something and it's fraudulent and a hoax, they're going to try to say something that's, uh, you know, kind of could sell, make sense. But when somebody comes up and says, well, you know, I was outside the craft and it was only that big, but when I got inside, it was a football field in size. I mean, I'm, you know, so we list all the weird aspects that had been reported and list all what would be the weird things you would find if you could engineer general relativity equations? And they matched up hand and glove. I'll give you some examples. 
For example, warp drive, how about zipping across the universe? And you always hear, well, you, you can't do that. It's, uh, you know, you can't beat the speed of light and so on. Well, that whole thing about not beating the speed of light has to do with Einstein's special theory of relativity. But it turns out that in general theory of relativity, there's a way to do that. Uh, here's a very famous astrophysicist by the name of Alcubierre. He was a Star Trek fan. And so he said, you know, I wonder if I could find solutions in general relativity that would let me make warp drive. And I have a lot of constraints on that. You know, I want to leave at breakfast time, have breakfast time at home, go to Alpha Centauri for lunch, <laughs> come back and have dinner with my family, and I want them still to be the same age I am. And on the trip, I don't want to be turned into salsa on the back of the spaceship with giant accelerations. In fact, I'd like to just be, feel like normal kind of things. And so he worked through that solution and developed what's now called the Alcubierre Warp Drive. He published this in an absolutely tier one uh, physics journal that deals with uh, general relativity. And so it was a very sort of famous uh, picture of what his uh, warp drive uh, solution looked like, where you sort of depress space-time metric, as we call it, in front of the ship and build it up behind and, and let space-time metric push you through and so on. So there's a whole cottage industry of general relativity theorists who are working on various forms of warp drive and so on. Well, what about the velocity of light constraint? Again, in general relativity, you can solve the equation and come up with something called, for example, a wormhole. And again, I'm not talking about fringe physics. This is uh, textbook material. Matt Visser is one of the great uh, general relativity theorists. And if there are any engineers in the crowd, for the engineers in the crowd, I would point out that, well, what do you mean by velocity of light? Velocity of light is given by a little equation here, one over the square root of the magnetic permeability and the dielectric permittivity of the vacuum. So if you want to go fast at the speed of light, you just simply arrange to reduce the value of those constants. And now the effective speed of light in your engineered region is much higher. And so even though you're zipping through a fast and speed of light as far as anyone on the ground is concerned, actually within your engineered space, you're not actually beating the speed of light, but, but it works in principle. So the take home message here is reduced time interstellar travel either by ET or ourselves in the future is not, as naive consideration might hold, fundamentally constrained by physical principles. And it can be addressed in exotic physics in engineering terms, metric engineering. So you might well ask, okay, well then, why aren't we zipping around the universe? And, well, unfortunately, when you solve the equation, you say, oh yeah, all these things could be done. What would be the engineering required to do it? Well, in our solution so far, it's, oh my gosh, we have to have so much energy density compactified in such a small volume, there's no way we can get here, get there with our present engineering uh, smarts. So it's going to be far future for us unless we happen to find some kind of back door that lets us through. <clears throat> So, in fact, that was one of the papers. In fact, this is the paper that uh, I published. So it was one of the uh, defense intelligence reference documents, one of the 38 that went up on the special website. But by the way, as I mentioned, we didn't tell these authors that we got 38 papers uh, generated by that this was some kind of spooky UFO program. No, we said, you can even publish your work in the open literature if you want. Of course, they didn't know it had anything to do with UFOs. So in fact, I published my paper, Advanced Space Propulsion Based on Vacuum Space-Time Metric Engineering in a, in a Physics Journal. Now we kept the list of these titles and the authors still secret. And then finally, somebody through a Freedom of Information Act request uh, got a letter from John McCain, which listed all of the papers and the authors and their affiliations I thought, oh my gosh, that means my phone is going to ring off the hook saying, what? 
you didn't tell me this was a UFO program. But actually, I haven't had any pushback, so lucky so far. The papers generally have not been, uh, have not been released by the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. And only a few have begun to publish some of the work, as, as I did here. So anyway, is there anything you can learn from this that can help us in, ter in terms of evaluating observations in the world associated with unidentified aerial phenomena? I'll just give you one example. And I have about a thousand I could give, but that would take a week or so. In this room, most of the electromagnetic energy you can't see. Why? Because it's in the infrared in the form of heat. And there's a very narrow band in the electromagnetic spectrum that you can see, and that's what we call, you know, the visible spectrum. And then there are higher frequencies into the ultraviolet and beyond that we, that we don't see. Now, it turns out that one of the side effects of engineering the space-time metric to get this kind of flight performance is that it, we call it, blue shifts the frequencies. All the frequencies that are involved get moved to a higher frequency. That's just built into what the equations say when you generate these anomalous effects. So what that means then, and it has significance for us, is the infrared we don't ordinarily see gets blue shifted up into the visible. So when we hear that these craft are so bright and so luminous when you see them, it's not, not, not uh, a surprise. And then what was in the visible spectrum gets shifted up into, let's say, the ultraviolet. And so if you get too close to one of these things that are powered up, you'll get a sunburn, often reported by people who have claimed to have gotten close to a craft. And if you get uh, too close, uh, you might actually pick up some of the blue shifted radiation from the visible that's now blue shifted up into the soft x-ray region and get radiation poisoning. And there have been cases where that's been reported. So having these set of equations and seeing what they predict and then going out and matching against real data, I mean, that's really a, really a boon. I'll give you one example. Claris Island in Brazil, 1977-1978, they had a massive wave that lasted for many days of like a scene from Close Encounters of the Third Kind or whatever. Hundreds of advanced aerospace vehicles were observed by civilians and the Brazilian Air Force investigative team. They set up a whole operation called Operation Plate by the Brazilian Air Force. More than 1,000 pages of documents, logs, sketches, and maps. More than 500 photographs. 15 hours of motion film, physiological effects, and medical injuries. And so in our ATIP program, all this information was compiled into a big database, and we uh, did our best to analyze the implications. So part of what led to the engineering, space-time metric engineering, as we call it, is when you see all these injuries, you say, well, what could have caused that? Well, this blue shifting would cause it. Well, where do you get blue shifting? Oh, from Einstein's equations, if you were able to generate the space-time metric engineering. So, you know, the medical injuries, some overlap with current cases, range all the way from numbness, headache, paralysis, uh, some deaths in here, and so on. So actually, having a model like this that can then be matched against data, even medical injury data, it turned out to be significant for us. Now, despite the programs, the progress in the programs with the advanced, uh, as an ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat mm -hmm. Identification Program, let's face it, the topic is inherently anomalous. No one would disagree with that. Therefore, despite the reality of the observation, the topic does not fit smoothly into a known profile of the Department of Defense or intelligence community structures. And especially if it's a very black program, you know, the Public Affairs Office <laughs> doesn't even know about it, doesn't know what you're dealing with. So it's, it's uh, not a happy marriage. And because of the national security implications, so much compartmentalization and stovepiping, it's very difficult to integrate all the data and, and make rapid progress. So <clears throat> progress in trying to get to the root of 
all these elements that are being observed is very difficult. And the advocacy of the issue in government circles was not viewed as career enhancing. <laughs> People are trying to push this inside the Pentagon, inside the intelligence community, always had to deal with pushback from higher level people who really didn't know what was going on. And it was so compartmentalized you couldn't brief them, tell them what was going on. So a group of us decided that we should set up an outreach program in the public sector and try to get as much information out there as, as we possibly could. So the goal was to establish a broad-based, high-quality, scientific community of interest to have the conversation in the public sector concerning UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena, and other related <laughs> leading-edge topics, because a lot of these topics uh, are linked. So we set up something called To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. And if you've been following the field, if you've probably seen reference to it. It was co-founded by Tom DeLong, senior intelligence officer from the Department of Defense and CIA and distinguished research scientists. It was structured as an SEC-regulated public benefit corporation. So that means it sort of lies between crowdfunding in one end and your usual uh, IP organization that you can buy and sell shares on the public market. It's kind of in between. And one of the requirements, I mean, people can uh, go to the website and buy shares. They just can't trade them until at some future point you have an IPO and you get into the regular market. And one of the requirements of public benefit corporation is that you have to provide something of value to the public. So educational aspects are a major requirement to have a public benefit corporation. And the structure is transparent. You can go to the website, to the starsacademy.com, and you can track everything that's going on. So it's a very rich web-based community of interest set up called The Vault, which is now being developed where there can be a lot of information transferred back and forth between the public and the organization and government entities and contractors. So it's growing. It was set up by Tom DeLong, as I said. I mean, he was the person who founded uh, Blink-182, the big rock band. I'd never heard of it. <laughs> when I talked to my son, they said, well, of course, everybody knows about Blink-182. Well, he's had a long, lifelong interest in uh, in the UFO, ET, alien topic, and so on. And <clears throat> because of his notoriety, he could always get into the office of uh, various DOD officials and high-level executives in aerospace corporations. And, and he made the big pitch that, uh, you know, everyone out in the street knows that something's going on. And the government is saying, you know, there's nothing going on. You know, that, 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 that's not good. It's not, it's not good for your industry. It's not good for the government, whatever. You should let me set up something where we kind of get a conversation going. So in fact, he was able to convince uh, people to do that. So we formed To The Stars Academy. He's the CEO, interim CEO. Lou Elizondo, you've probably seen his face if you follow this area at all. He was the person, the last person in the Pentagon who actually ran the ATIP program. And he was frustrated because he couldn't get more uh, ass uh, assets uh, to help resolve the problem and so on. He's one of those people who realized, you know, this is not career enhancing and so on. So he actually left, even though he was running the program, to join to the stars. And he's taken a very public uh, stance, and you see him on news programs all the time. Here he is on CNN. So he's in charge of our Global Affairs and Security Division of TTSA. Chris Mellon, he joined. He's still a consultant to the, national, to the intelligence community and national security matters. He had a 20-year career included being Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. Uh, he also has been very strong both publicly and you'll see him in, in interviews uh, often, 
if you follow this topic. He's on Tucker Carlson, <laughs> up, and on, up and down. But he's also very good at behind the scenes interactions with senators and congressmen uh, and arranging for briefs. I mean, I briefed two congressional committees uh, recently uh, myself. So, so he's, he, he's, he's quite a superstar in helping us. Jim Simavan uh, just retired from the CIA. He was one of the two James Bond kinds of people. I've heard his stories. Uh, you know, and he needed to get a missile out of uh, Iran or whatever. I mean, he'd be the one to figure out how to go over there and buy it. And so he was an operations officer, both overseas and domestically. He's on our board. He's in charge of operations, vice president for operations. Steve Justice, uh, who I had briefed many times at highly classified levels when he was running black programs at uh, Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. And I couldn't believe it that about the time I joined, he left Skunk Works and agreed to join also. So he's uh, in charge, he's, a vice, he's, he's a vice president, well, he's, he's uh, in charge of uh, the aerospace division of TTSA. Brilliant guy, knows everything, billion dollar programs, all black, that he was in charge of. I mean, we're talking about heavy hitters here. And then there's me. <laughs> I had my physics background, happy as a clam, PhD from Stanford, working on lasers. Got my first laser patent while I was still a PhD student or whatever. But in addition to that life, which has resulted in I don't know, some 200 publications and three patents and so on, in the background, I also had this other life because I started out as a naval intelligence officer <coughs> stationed at the National Security Agency, NSA, between my uh, master's and my PhD before I went out to Stanford to get my PhD. And so I had that background. And so it turns out that every time there's a problem that somebody wants to solve and they want a physicist who's had clearances and they know they can trust and they know the area is so weird that no other physicists are going to agree to do anything about it, who are you going to call? So, so that's how I get involved in these programs. And we have a couple of uh, people who are really savvy people who, who run investment groups to handle the uh, financial aspects of TTSA. And so the SEC filings and everything is all out there on the website. So it's a very transparent organization. Of course, we don't all tell everything we know, but uh, Chris Mellon is also uh, the chair of a science advisory board and several distinguished uh, scientists and academicians. So if you go to the website, uh, you can see their CVs and backgrounds. You'll see that many of them have been involved at CIA or Department of Defense or whatever with fantastic backgrounds of information. So that they can make a real contribution. And as a science advisory board, make sure that we stay in the straight and narrow with any claims we have. <clears throat> so what are TTSA's goals? First of all, promote the concept that forefront topics should not be considered taboo for investigation by scientists. I mean, that's always been a problem with these kinds of topics. Remote viewing, telepathy, psychokinesis, UFOs, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And of course, to generate funding. I mean, that's why we have a website where people can send money uh, to underwrite significant research in the areas. But because of our public benefit corporation element, uh, we want to have user-friendly databases so they can be universal access to whatever information we can come up with and that we can reveal. And to provide positive support for collaboration between government, aerospace industry, academia, to accomplish all these things. For example, we just recently signed something called an Army CRADA with uh, the Army. CRADA stands for uh, Cooperative Research and Development Agreement. And so uh, we're still doing things uh, with, with the government as well as with the public. But since part of our remit as a public benefit corporation, we create entertainment properties, books, documentaries, films, and all that kind. 
uh, it also makes money <laughs> to help support the research. For example, there's a series, the Secret Machine series, is uh, now two volumes out, which is uh, science fiction, written by Tom DeLonge and, and uh, another author, uh, <clears throat> which kind of incorporates the ideas that we're talking about only at a fiction level. There's also another series, God's Man and War, by Peter Lavenda, uh, that explores humanity's history going back thousands of years on claimed interaction with other kinds of beings, whether it's angels or aliens or jinn or who knows what they are. So it's, it's, it's a nice compendium of the fact that there's a rich history throughout our whole culture about interaction with non-human beings. So the structures, we have a science structure that has a series of programs, an aerospace structure, for example, a beam energy uh, propulsion launch program is one we're trying to get funded at this point. Ordinarily, when you put something into orbit, you got, you're carrying all that rocket fuel, and that takes up most of the uh, volume, and you get a very small payload. Well, it turns out you can leave all the rocket fuel home and just have really giant lasers on the ground that then hit the back of a satellite, a CubeSat, that you want to launch. And so there's a whole industry there already proven by NASA and the Air Force to be a viable industry, but the infrastructure hasn't been set up because, I mean, we got rockets working. Who wants to put a billion dollars in to a new industry before we actually can use it? Um, but anyway, that's something that should be done, and, and, and once that area gets uh, filled out and, and, and brought up to speed, the cost for launching satellites into orbit will be 10% of what it is now. So everybody recognizes the economic potential, but who wants to put in all the money to build it until a decade or now from you actually use it and, and make money? So it's, it's a tough road to haul. And of course, because of the entertainment and public interface, uh, documentaries, TV, books, and so on. So what are activities to date? Well, I mean, in some sense, we were responsible for legitimizing the topic in the mainstream press. So that was really a sea change about this subject area. And TTSA working in public and also behind the scenes, this is one of their successes. As I say, Lou Elizondo, he's out there, top media presenting the facts. So that, that's a big change. And it's given the quality of the sources coming out from the shadows. I mean, ex-Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, top-rated F-18 pilots, important government officials. The bar has been raised on legitimization. So after that New York Times article in December 2017, the ridicule factor has, by and large, gone way down in comparison to the uh, acceptance that there's something here. The three high-quality F-18 videotapes of unidentified aerial phenomena, I showed you one here. You can go on the internet or to the TTSA uh, website and, and see the others. They've been pulled out of the Pentagon and released due to the pressure from uh, primarily Lou Elizondo. And we set up meetings with uh, people in foreign UAP programs. Uh, some of them have promised to provide us data and even materials from crashed craft. In the past, whenever some foreign company, a country came up with some, let's say some material or whatever, call in the United States, give it to them, it disappears in a black hole, and they never find out anything about it. So that's the end of that. Well, we're coming on as a public benefit corporation and saying, you know, you give us pieces. Whatever we learn in our evaluation is gonna go on a website for the public, so it's not gonna disappear in a black hole. So suddenly we have generals in other countries. I, mean, I met with a general from Brazil on this whole issue myself uh, who, who are, are really willing to cooperate. And of course, negotiations with media outlets to share documentation are in process. Some of you may know uh, or have seen Unidentified. It was a History Channel uh, series of several episodes that uh, 
went forward last year. We're now recording the second season. And unlike Ancient Aliens on History Channel, that has a lot of speculation and stuff that's fascinating, but you don't know how much of it is, is, is real. And also unlike things like UFO Hunters, where people go out and uh, talk to people and you get a pretty sensationalistic view, the Unidentified Program really went out of its way to like really just reveal the facts. So most of Lou's time was going around interviewing the F-18 pilots, interviewing the radar operators uh, on the ships, uh, and that, that kind of thing. So uh, it was pretty straight line. No, no exaggerate, went out of our way. In that whole program, you'll never hear anybody say the word alien. I mean, until, until it's absolutely nailed down what's going on. Speculation is off the table. Just the facts, man. That's it. We'll follow the data. Wherever the data leads us, it'll be tall. But that's what it is. Follow the data. Now, some of the uh, pressure and especially behind the scenes stuff, the Navy finally confirmed for the first time that those videos really are unidentified aerial phenomena. I mean, after the videos were released, you had everybody and their cousins saying, oh, well, maybe it's just some new drone uh, that the Navy or the Air Force is testing and, and whatever. I mean, why should I think it's really that they don't know what it is? But because of the pressure and the FOA requests and briefing behind the scenes, the Navy finally agreed to come forward and say they really are unidentified. Um, for example, in uh, Politico, Brian Bender, writing about defense, said the U.S. Navy is drafting new guidelines for reporting UFOs. I mean, up until this time, I've told you there were decades of Navy pilots running into these things all over the place, but they never reported them. Why? Because they were concerned their superiors would tell them, okay, you've been smoking dope or something, I mean... What's going on? So no one wanted to lose their flight status by reporting UFOs, so they didn't. Now, because of the pressure, the Navy has come out and put out official edicts to the F-18 and other pilots saying, if you see a UFO, first of all, grab all the data you can. And I've seen some neat ones where the pilots actually use their cell phones to <laughs> take a picture. Uh, and you must report it. So that's now part of the new culture. And uh, the Navy even has admitted they're providing a series of briefings for senior, by senior Naval intelligence officers as well as aviators who reported hazards to aviation safety. So this is not just lying in a little cloister of uh, uh, people who'd like to kind of be part of this kind of thing. No, it's, it's, it's being briefed. You won't hear who's being briefed because they don't, don't, don't want to make an issue of it, but there are a lot of people at high places being briefed. I even saw in the Tucker Carlson show that President Trump was told that, oh, these briefs are going on, what do you think? And he said, oh, I sort of, I don't know about that, but on the other hand, I, our pilots are really short people, so it's, anyway. So that's the back story and the forward story. The back story is, DIA set up this program, one in 2008, that had a whole precedence of other programs, other programs ongoing. And then the forward story is some of us uh, coming forward to form Two Stars Academy uh, to try to get a better acceptance and more conversation out in the public. And so that's what we've been doing. That's our forward story contribution. So that's that's the story. Thanks for your, for your interest. Okay, this is a reasonable question. Uh, well, how, how does our organization, our viewpoint, my viewpoint, uh, consider the other viewpoints out there? For example, there's a whole group of people who are talking about we have bases on Mars, there's a secret uh, UFO program, uh, we got spacecraft all over the place <clears throat> in the solar system, and um, many other organizations 
pushing certain viewpoints like that. From our standpoint, uh, we're just following, and I personally <clears throat> am just following the data and what I can really get my hands around somehow. And so when I read many of these other or hear many of these other uh, claims that uh, you know, we have a secret uh, space program already ongoing, I mean, I can't absolutely refute it, but I, I have no evidence in, in my programs I've been involved with. I haven't seen any evidence like that. So um, <clears throat> I just put all that in a gray basket on the shelf and stick with what we can uh, follow with data. And basically, my colleagues within TTSA are doing the same thing. I mean, we don't even go so far as to say, well, we know they're ET spaceships. Some people may think that, but we, we don't say anything along those lines because until we have hard evidence, that's what we've committed ourselves to having in the public conversation, things that can be verified, documented, and so on, and we'll leave the speculation to elsewhere. <laughs> Uh, how soon will Warp Drive be available for, for civilian use? What's part? Is there more to the question? No, he's going to record your answer. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet there's a lot more to the question. Um, certainly, uh, we, we have people working on the theoretical physics of it, as I say, space-time metric engineering and so on, that would say that in principle, Warp drive is, is possible, or wormhole uh, access out into the cosmos is possible. Uh, we've all seen, uh, many of us seen Ehlers Interstellar, which is a terrific movie. The <coughs> science advisor to that movie was Kip Thorne, one of the top <coughs> general relativity people from Princeton. So the science in that uh, program is absolutely, absolutely perfect. In fact, he, he expressed the fact that He's really glad that that movie got made because there are a lot of solutions in general relativity that you would have to understand to make the concepts that were shown in the movie, but no academic budget was able to put up the money to run all those computer programs. But in Hollywood, they did. And so in fact, they, they learned a lot and were able to publish things based on the, uh, what, what's been, what, what was done by the Hollywood uh, industry, computer industry. <clears throat> but in terms of uh, generally uh, thinking that we're going to get from here to there in our lifetime or m maybe even within a century, right now we don't see a path forward. So either it's as hard as the equations would now predict mm -hmm. and therefore warp, driving, warp drive probably is going to happen for a century or maybe more, or there's some back door to the Alamo, so to speak, uh, that we can do an end around run and find some lower energy way of, of uh, generating things like warp drive and wormholes and so on that we just haven't discovered yet. So of course that's a big issue behind government and aerospace corporation programs is to try to figure out how these things work and see if there is some uh, unknown shortcut that we, we could take. So at this point, all I could say for sure is it's going to be a century or more. And if it pops up to be usable within our lifetimes, that's because somebody has really found a magic key to, to the lock. So at this point, we don't see where it will come from. Okay, this is a question about well, what about free energy technology? I mean, <coughs> there are a lot of uh, energy buffs out there. In fact, for a long time I was one myself because I <clears throat> spent a number of years uh, investigating potential applications of zero-point energy, so-called. Um, and one of the, uh, you might say, attractive aspects was, wow, there's all that energy in the vacuum fluctuations, maybe we can tap some of it. And so, in fact, we even set up a Maverick Inventor program in, in our lab and we said, okay, as smart as we think we are, we may not be able to find the answer, but maybe it's some guy in a garage who doesn't know enough physics and he does some stupid experiment that no physicist would ever think of doing and he happens to stumble on, whoa, here's an energy source. And so in our Maverick Inventor program, we put out the word that if you think you've got, quote, 
a free energy device, an over unity energy source or whatever. Bring it to us. We have this giant million dollar calorimeter that's excellent for measuring energy. And uh, we've had people show up from as far away as China to have their devices looked at. I looked at many cold fusion examples that were brought to us and so on. And I'm sorry to say that even though our investor at the time said, you know, just find one that works and, you know, we're all going to be trillionaires here. Um, the truth of the matter is we, uh, our, our website is a graveyard of dashed inventor streams. So <laughs> at this point, I haven't seen any evidence for workable new, quote, free energy or over unity energy device, even though I mean, it's interesting. For example, vacuum fluctuation energy, put a couple of plates up, uh, electromagnetic energy fluctuating in the vacuum. Uh, as it turns out, the modes that can exist between the plates is uh, restricted because you have to match the boundary condition. There's no restrictions on the modes outside the plates. It'll push the plates together, so-called Casimir effect. And hey, you got a puff of energy <coughs> out of the vacuum fluctuations. Whoa. But then what do you do? If you pull the plates apart, you have to put in as much energy as you got. So that's not the way to go. Uh, I, I know of one way that I think should be explored, and, and uh, my colleagues and I had worked on it, uh, Bernie Hayes and Garrett Modell, and uh, they actually got a patent on it. A very, very difficult experiment to do, uh, circulating hydrogen gas through nanopores, and, some possibility of, of, of doing something, but it's a very expensive experiment way out there in terms of the technology you need to do it. So at this point, I have yet to see, even though I've had a lot of interest in it, uh, any new energy devices to come out of these new concepts. Sorry to say. This is a question about uh, Richard Doty has stated uh, on the internet, a very controversial figure, as, as many of you would know. <clears throat> and he stated that he had worked for us for, I guess, over a decade or whatever. That was a period in which we were really investigating all kinds of aspects of the phenomena that I talked about today. And so we had all kinds of consultants. And Richard Doty was one of them. And so uh, he gathered up information that, that he could gather up and thought we'd be interested in, but he was like one of many. And so uh, even though he's a very controversial figure out there, we're not sure if the data he provided, what was the percentage of, that we could really count on. But hey, we, we, let, we, did, we didn't want to leave any stone unturned, any, anything that might be hiding under a rock. So we had several people, and, and he was one, who consulted with us, and uh, you know he told us about various sightings and um, certain aspects of government programs and so on. So, uh, so what he says is true, and uh, it'd be too long to try to go into the data he provided us. But some of it we evaluated and couldn't verify, and some of it we couldn't verify, and some of it we're pretty sure might not exactly be the case. But he was a counterintelligence officer, so that, that would be okay. That's his, that would be his job. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we interacted with all levels of people in and out of the government. So it's not surprising that, you know, if we were doing all of this and trying to find out everything we could find out, why would we leave out of our toolkit somebody who's making these big claims and was clearly part of a program? So yeah, we, we worked with him. Uh, I happen to like him as an individual, actually, so he's a nice guy. Okay, the question had to do with <coughs> the 38 papers that we, that we commissioned that gave us looks at all kinds of advanced technologies with our question of where will your area of expertise be by the year 2050 that could make a contribution to aerospace uh, engineering and flight and so on. And so a lot of the information that came out of those programs was you know, pretty startling. I mean, some was very, you know, quite originally quite sensitive. I and mean, we had to beat up on people in some aerospace corporations and say, well, come on, tell me something about plasma physics there for propulsion. And why can't it's classified? Well, you know, dig something out there. So anyway, because these were unclassified uh, papers. So, Given the broad span, as you could see in my listing of the 38 areas, 
of new technologies coming along. Uh, I think it's reasonable to think that at some point there will be a fusion that will really, really, really make a big difference. Of course, way back when um, early people investigating electromagnetic effects uh, did things, who could have predicted a cell phone? Uh, one, of the, one of the great examples I have actually was given to me by Steve Justice from Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, who's now in the uh, uh, part of TTSA. He said that he found an article in 19 something or other, years and years ago, saying, well, you know, someday there will be an army officer could carry a 50 pound pack on his back and be able to tell exactly where he is on the surface of the earth. And that'll probably happen in 10 or 15 years. Of course, we now all have that in our cell phones. So it's always the case that predicting ahead usually falls short rather than overestimating where you're going to get to. So all I can say is that given the level of technologies that are being pursued in every area, and they're being pursued with better and better instrumentation, so the product per unit time is actually going up exponentially. So I'm certain that uh, you know, within 10, 20 years or whatever, we're going to have some amazing technologies that if I were to try to list them right now, any reasonable person would say, well, that's ridiculous. We're, we're not going to get from here to there. So, so that, that, that's, that's the point of TTSA and many of the aerospace corporations we work with is, well, let's just plumb everything in sight and see how far and fast we can get. So warp drive in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> he suggests warp drive in 30 years. Uh, since I'm living in the present, I would say, not a chance. That was a joke. I know. But 30 years from now, you might look back and say, what? You know, you should have known better. Of course we're going to get it. Why don't you say something? Uh, he asked a question about uh, another sordid part of my past, <laughs> <laughs> working with ESP and remote viewing and Ingo Swan and so on. Uh, that was really, really quite a deal. There's an interesting background about how all that happened, and I should tell you, <clears throat> At the time, I was a very straight arrow physicist. And in fact, I had just co-authored a textbook while I was at Stanford on fundamentals of quantum electronics, which was a graduate level textbook, published in English, French, Russian, and Chinese. I was at the top of my game. And, um, but one of the things that bothered me and bothered many of my physics colleagues were, well, what about consciousness? What about sentience? Is it still atoms and molecules all the way down? It's just too complicated for us to figure out? Or are there some additional fields beyond uh, what we know, the four forces and so on? And so that bugged me, writing a textbook, didn't know the answer, it bugs a lot of my colleagues. So I was always on the search for, was there any evidence that there's other kinds of fields that we don't know about, you know, we should find out. <clears throat> it was about that time that Cleve Baxter, who uh, is, is famous, well, he's a famous polygraph expert, taught polygraph to FBI, CIA, law enforcement organizations. And one day on a lark, he just connected his polygraph up to a plant. And he saw signals coming out of the plant that looked pretty much like what he sees on people. And so he said, well, I, I think I'm going to threaten the plant like I would a person. And so he got out his uh, matchbook and he saw a big response on the plant. He thought, oh my gosh, maybe this means plants are sentient at some level. So then he started doing experiments where he had a plant here and a plant here. He'd do something to disturb this plant, and this plant would show a signal. And so that was published. And um, I saw that, and while I was ruminating over my idea about, well, what are, are there extra fields or whatever? So I said, okay, I'm going to set up a really cool experiment. 100% of physics experiment, nothing to do with remote viewing, nothing to do with ESP, nothing to do with psychokinesis. I was just going to grow some algae culture together, separate the two uh, cultures, zap this one with a laser, and see if that one responded, measure the velocity of propagation between the two. So I bundled all that up into a proposal and sent it off to uh, Cleve Baxter in New York. And said, so, well, what do you think of my idea to try to kind of replicate your effect in a real high-tech kind of way? 
Well, it's one of those things where your life takes an unbelievable turn uh, based on pure random coincidence. It turned out that Cleve Baxter and Ingo Swan, the famous psychic and remote viewer, met at a cocktail party in New York City. And they were talking about what they do, and so Cleve invited him over to his lab to see if he could uh, affect his plants, if the plants would respond to him. While he was there, he saw my proposal on Cleve's desk. So he wrote me a letter saying, well, if you're interested in that sort of borderline between animate and inanimate physics, why do you want to deal with uh, algae culture? They can't tell you what's happening. You should be dealing with somebody like me. Ordinarily, I mean, I was really, as I say, a straight arrow physicist, I would just throw that in the garbage, except attached to the letter was a big report of an experiment that had been done in City College in New York, where on command, working with Gertrude Schmeidler there, he was able to make the temperature of temperature measuring devices that were in thermos bottles on the other side of the lab go up and down on command. I said, oh my gosh, that's, you know, that's physics. So I decided to invite him out to Stanford Research Institute, where I was at the time. And I told my physics colleagues, hey, I've got this, quote, psychic coming. He said, oh my god, they're all frauds and charlatans. You know, you better really have a good experiment. Well, as it turns out, I did have a good experiment. It turned out that we had a million dollar or whatever uh, special magnetometer that was being built, uh, that had been built to detect quarks, which are subnuclear particles. And anyway, there's this little quantum chip down inside this device, surrounded by electrical shielding, surrounded by magnetic shielding, surrounded by superconducting shielding. No way that anything from the outside could affect that. So I grabbed him by the arm and took him over there and said, you know, I sort of have a kind of a high-tech version of what you did in New York with those temperature measuring devices. I want you to see if you can affect this. So on command, he, puts, he put signals on there that were absolutely, undoubtedly effects of what he was doing. And of course, the graduate student whose life depended on this being imperturbable from the outside, Wait, wait a minute, there must be some bubbles in the liquid helium line. You know, I gotta get, get rid of this. Let me check, let me check. So I'm, I'm sure that was just some kind of glitch, some kind of coincidence, and now I was running fine. Said, okay, Ingo, you wanna try that again? You reproduce the same effect. <laughs> and so the graduate student again said, well, you guys go get, it. Go get a break. Uh, go, go to the, you know, the restaurant or, or something, and let, let me find out what's wrong with my system. It was running just fine. We came back in and uh, said, well, I'm, I'm sure you can't do that again. He did it again. And I'm not talking about a little signal peeking out of, out of the noise. I'm talking about something that generally looks like that and it's a <laughs> So, of course, he kicked us out of the lab and said, never went back here again. <laughs> the Navy had paid for the development of this thing. Well, you know, how did this happen? The result of that was that I wrote it up. I mean, I know it's a long answer to your question. I wrote it up, circulated around to physics friends. Somebody dropped in on a CIA desk. Suddenly, the D CIA descends on my doorstep. They said, oh, have we been looking for you? <laughs> I said, why? You know, what did I do? He said, look, Russia and the East Bloc countries are spending millions of dollars for years on ESP research. No scientists in America believe there is such a thing. And yet you did this experiment. We looked into your background and saw that you had all these clearances because you'd been a naval intelligence officer stationed at NSA, so we knew we could count on talking to you. <coughs> you had SRI, we have lots of black, black projects here anyway. Why don't you invite Ingo out here and look into this? And of course their hope was that I'd invite him out to some really tough experiments and it wouldn't work and they could just take this off the plate and never have to worry about it. Well, that's not what happened. It grew into a 23-year, multi-million dollar project, and we ended up, I mean, it was a big deal. We trained Army intelligence officers to use remote viewing. Um, I briefed all kinds of people, including Bill Casey when he was Reagan's director of CIA and directors of DIA. I appeared before uh, Senate uh, or Congressional Intelligence Committees and so on. You know, it came out to be a big thing. It was still all top secret, all wrapped up. But now it's all been declassified. You can buy a big book called Stargate Chronicles uh, on the internet and see all of the reports we wrote that I thought would never see the light of day. 
all because Ingo Swan did what he did uh, and then showed up at that cocktail party. And so he, it was, uh, the thing about Ingo Swan, since you're interested in him, was he's very inward looking. He could figure out what he was doing. And so he was able to lay out a procedure for how to accomplish the remote viewing tasks. And then we were able to train those with other people. So he was a real contributor. He's a very, very smart guy. And by the way, you might think that psychics say, try to take a, you know, credit for anything. No, he was the hardest guy. If we said, well, that looks like that really worked, if he could find a loophole and say, well, we're not going to count that. Uh, you know, if you, if you accept something that's kind of borderline, it's got a loophole, then it destroys the credibility of all the other research. So he was one of the toughest people to accept that there had been an actual result. So I, I've always had great respect for him. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. The question is, I uh, hear from a colleague of mine, Eric Davis, who, who worked for me. Uh, he's now at the Aerospace Corporation. And he had mentioned that I had uh, written a paper that's not been published, or, but it's been somewhat circulated on what I call ultra-terrestrials. As I said, we're just following the data. And so I've got my colleagues who say, oh my god, the aliens are here. I've got Jacques Vallée telling me, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, these are interdimensional, you know, whatever, whatever. So I decided to write down all options and put it in a paper called Ultra Terrestrials and circulate it among my colleagues to say, we can't overlook anything. We must not come to a conclusion before we've looked at every possibility. So who knows? Maybe they're ETs living here, they got stranded here millennia ago. Or maybe there's some aerospace corporations has put all this stuff together and it's being hidden. Or maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's aliens. Or maybe it's, so I listed all possible, or maybe it's just you know, tra time travelers from the future that happen to be showing up. So I put all of the aspects of what it might be, given that we can't say for sure, and then what are the elements you would look for to find out if this were true, or this were true, or this were true. So this whole idea of, quote, ultra-terrestrials is something that kind of floats around in the community. A great book by Mac Tony, I think is his name, um, has, a, has a title almost like that. So, so anyway, it was just, a, it was just a, a circulated think piece to, to realize, okay, we should quit being reporters and turn into intelligence officers and go out and seek data instead of just being at the passive end, waiting for the government to tell us what, or waiting for the aliens to tell us what, or you know, whatever. No, we, we should turn into uh, policemen who are searching for clues and trying to build a case for this possibility, or this possibility, or this possibility. And fleshing out those possibilities, you know, if it's this, well then maybe there are a lot of corporations involved, so we should be looking into their financial structure. Or maybe it's this, well, we should be looking. So anyway, that, it was a circulated paper, which I'm not ready to publish yet. Oh, this question has to do with the fact that there have been people in general, and people within TTSA specifically, who are talking about the apparent observation of craft who can move through any kind of media. They can be maybe coming from outer space, and then they're in our atmosphere, and then they dive into the water. Uh, that's a tough aerospace <laughs> engineering to try to come to grips with. We do have craft that can kind of go in the water and then come out that are, but you know, not, not with the kind of characteristics that are being observed. And then she added under that, well, what about uh, going into matter? Well, I mean, it just turns out. <laughs> that one of the outcomes in the list of weird things from space-time metric engineering is that materials under those conditions are so hardened that they're like made out of diamond or, or better, and the rest of the world looks like butter. So even going into matter, going high velocity into the water or whatever uh, is one of the predictions of the modeling. 
So I uh, haven't talked about it specifically. I mean, there, there have been some reported cases, but you know, they came from the public, so you don't know whether to believe it or not, of craft going into mountains and stuff like that. No explosion, no. So anyway, those, that's all just debris, intellectual debris on the table that we're trying to put together like a, pu a jigsaw puzzle. And um, so there hasn't been any particular reason not to talk about it or to talk about it. I mean, the data we have, and we're following the data, that's where we want to concentrate. Uh, we, don't, we don't have good data on that. So I happen to be personally interested because it's one of the predictions of the modeling. But uh, so anyway, that's, that's where that stands. Okay, since uh, it's a question that sort of implies, well, since, since you're involved, involved in all these sorted areas, <laughs> have you thought about using remote viewing to try and answer questions about craft and so on? Um, there have been attempts by some of the, because we started remote viewing programs, Army Intelligence and so on, and those people have all now retired from Army Intelligence, and they're now out in the public giving courses on remote viewing. And uh, a number of them have attempted to get answers to questions about UAP using remote viewing. Uh, uh, as, as far as coming up with something solid, I mean, a couple of times when I, when we had some pretty good evidence of a craft caught under good national means, sent remote viewers to so try to figure out how it was operating. Uh, the descriptions were too, we would say, right brain. I mean, it turns out remote viewing is very uh, much of a right brain, artistic kind of thing, as opposed to a left brain analytical thing. So attempts to try to figure out technology about it uh, by remote viewers has not been particularly uh, useful. Um, a lot of anomalies show up. I mean, we had uh, one of our best remote viewers was Pat Price. And uh, in addition to doing all the wonderful stuff he was doing for us, this will give you an idea of how good a remote viewer can be. This is during the first, uh, first four years of Nixon's presidency. He came in one morning and he said, well, you know, Nixon's not going to make it through the second term because there's something in his office that's going to harm him. Well, we had to report that to the CIA, so they went over there and they looked for toxic substances, hidden microwave generators. <laughs> they couldn't find anything. Of course, we now know by history that it was the tape recorder that did him in. When he told us that, uh, we said, oh my gosh, that means Spiro Agno will be president. <laughs> and he says, no, he goes first. <laughs> Well, it turns out he did go first for some kind of money laundering scheme or whatever. And so uh, you got a guy with that kind of ability, and you know, one day he comes in and says, well, I found four UFO bases on, on, on the planet. I'll give you their locations. Well, I didn't really want to report that, but, but I had to. And so it turns out one of my contract monitors, well, one of the locations was in Australia. Uh, near Mount Zeal, and so I told my contract monitor, I got, you know, this crazy list of places and so on. He says, well, I know the station uh, keeper in Australia. Uh, I'll call him out there. I won't tell him why I'm calling, but uh, I'll just see if what I can find out. So I called him up and said, uh, you know, I'm interested in that area around Mount Zeal. And the guy immediately said, oh, you mean where the UFOs are always flying around? <laughs> so. Does that mean it might be possible to collect data on UFOs using remote viewing? Maybe. But uh, I do not know of any actual effort under good circumstances with great follow-up uh, to take advantage of remote viewing in the UAP area. So that's something left for the future. So I guess the question really has to do with um, specifically about TTSA, are we pursuing, uh, let's say, advanced physics that might include the more arcane aspects? 
Right now, we're not pursuing elements of, uh, he wants to know if we are pursuing elements of, or what about consciousness with regard to UAP phenomena and so on? Are we pursuing anything like that within TTSA? Uh, not particularly at this point. Uh, I know that there, are, I know people who are pursuing that kind of thing. In fact, in the absolutely straight arrow quantum physics community, now that we're digging into things like quantum entanglement and so on, there's a lot of discussion of, well, uh, is consciousness just an emergent epiphenomena of our atoms and molecules? Or does consciousness have its own sub-platform on which the physical universe is built? And so there are real physicists who have really good credentials. They're actually doing experiments to try to answer questions like that. Because it's built in quantum physics that we have non-locality. And it's built in quantum physics that there is entanglement over time and space. So there's a lot of, uh, you might say, the philosophical elements of very straight academic quantum physics. They're looking into exactly those kinds of issues of the connection between consciousness and what otherwise we call the, the physical world. <clears throat> so um, you know, if anything comes out of that that looks useful, you can be sure that I and my colleagues at TTSA will try to see if we can take advantage of the knowledge that's, that's being developed. But right now, I, I, don't, I don't know of anyone particularly looking into that. Well, the question is, uh, is there just sort of one type of UAV or UFO or whatever we see out there? Or are there many different kinds? And uh, have we made a connection whether these might be alien or not and so on? The scattering of options that are absolutely picked up on the best of our military platforms are all over the map. I don't know if you've heard, for example, there's a sphere with a cube inside, dashes between two of our F-18 pilots. In fact, that's the event that caused the aviation safety thing to then move to the element of requesting that pilots report their UFO sightings because it was an aviation safety issue, not a woo-woo issue. And so, uh, and then there's a tic-tac shape. And then there, there, there's really good data on triangles and so on. So there are a lot of different uh, uh, structures that are reported under, under good conditions. And so it isn't just one kind of thing, for sure. This is a question on the bismuth magnesium uh, sample, which it's unbelievably complicated and, and, and it's all over the internet with everyone from, this comes from a well-known process of, uh, that, that's known in, in sucking bismuth out of uh, magnesium with mercury and so on that kind of thing, just off of a factory floor versus claims that this, this definitely did come from an alien crash retrieval and so on. So the answer is we don't yet really know where it came from. And uh, it's true that 10 years ago, Linda Howe provided us a sample. And we did a lot of tests, got electron microscope pictures, and radiated it with uh, various gigahertz frequencies, or megahertz frequencies, and so on. Could, couldn't make any, any, anything out of it. So it kind of went on the shelf. And then it was only after this paper in Metamaterials was published, we said, oh my gosh, the claim here that this could have some real utility as microscopic waveguides would actually fit the structure you know, that we see there. OK, well, where do we go with that? Well, the truth of the matter is that piece is actually pretty mangled. And what you'd really like to do is say, OK, well, let's have a nice, clean piece of this, and let's irradiate with terahertz frequencies, first of all, to see if it really does act as a microscopic waveguide for terahertz frequencies. And then if that works, we'll you know, irradiate it with other kinds of fields and see if there are any un unexpected responses and so on. So it is still, despite the fact that it gets unbelievable publicity out there, it's still an absolutely unknown that does range all the way from, this was a fraud of junk material sent to us, to no, this came off the wedge of an ET craft. We don't know the answer to that. And 
the only way we're going to get something of value is to determine its properties or maybe reproduce it under nice conditions and determine its properties. So it's still a giant question mark out there. So even though it's, uh, it's, you know, it's like a few percent of our effort at TTSA, it's like 99% of our criticism. So <laughs> that's just what you get in this field. That's the way it goes. Some of us have developed very hard skins. A question about Ingo Swan and his reporting of uh, being on the moon. I don't know if it was on the on the back side or not. Um, Detail the book penetration. Yeah, I, I know. I know the book in great detail. Uh, I didn't remember that it was on the dark uh, the back side or the front side or whatever. While we had, it's exactly as it describes in the book actually. While we were doing remote viewing, we're getting twenty percent hit rate, 30%, 40%, 50%. And one day someone had somehow gotten into his crypto locked office and left a note on his desk saying, when you get to 70%, let us know. And you let us know by some procedure, I forget what it was. And so when he finally got up to that point, uh, he did let whoever said that know. And so they showed up and said, and apparently part of some kind of black program, and said, uh, not your remote viewing is that good. We want to uh, use your talents to do some exploration. So, you know, right out of a movie, you know, meet him in New York City, put a black bag over his head, drive around, <laughs> go to an underground facility, blah, 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 blah. Very military kinds of people. And they just gave him some coordinates, because by then we're doing coordinate remote viewing, realizing that they actually send somebody to a site, you can just use coordinates. Explaining that's a whole other thing, but anyway. And so he was getting descriptions and so on. They're really strange, because he didn't realize that there were coordinates on the moon. And it turned out his descriptions uh, were matching features of the moon. And at some point he said, you know, am I looking at the moon? And they agreed that he was. and. Uh, he was actually shocked by some of the stuff that you can read about in the book, Penetration. So that was like some kind of test of, of whether that could happen. And he'd already shown that he had the ability to do remote viewing in remote locations because before NASA's flyby of Jupiter, he found the thin rings around Jupiter. And we reported them in our book called Mindreach ahead of NASA getting there. And Carl Sagan came by our lab and said, you know, this stuff he generated, it's ridiculous. There's only stuff you can get out of any encyclopedia. And he's got rings around Jupiter. I mean, that sounds like Saturn. There are no rings around Jupiter. And of course, when the probe actually got there, uh, there were rings around Jupiter, very thin. So it's no. So he was ahead of everybody in that. So anyway, these people knew about that. And so then the second thing they did is uh, sometime later they showed up and said, uh, we want to take you to a place up in the north, and so he didn't know where it was, Alaska, Canada, whatever. And they had him there, and the UFO came over a lake that they knew was going to come over at a certain time. How'd they know that? I don't know. And so he, they wanted him to say anything about it. And he said, you know, he was so scared he couldn't say anything about it. Anyway, the book goes on, on those kind of things. Uh, he didn't know how to come to grips with that. Uh, he was, uh, even though we're on t top secret projects, he had to wait 10 years before he could tell me that. Uh, he waited 12 years because he was really afraid I'd really get mad at him for not sharing this. And <clears throat> so anyway, I came to my own conclusions about, uh, you know, that he was being tested by people who already knew the answers. They just wanted to see if they were vulnerable to remote viewers. And he insisted, no, no, they were trying to get answers that they didn't know the answers to. So we never agreed on, on that. So anyway, that's, that's a, long, a, a bit of arcana about a very long story. OK, his question is about uh, what I raised about how everything is being sort of compartmentalized, what we say, stovepiped. Is there any way to cut through that? Well, in the ATIP program, we were doing our best to cut through that. That's why we got all these individual 38 papers and then made them available to everyone. 
And so behind the scenes, there are efforts to get people talking to each other, all of whom have their little fiefdoms. And so whether that's going to work out, I don't know the answer to yet. So we're doing our best. So the question is, uh, given that in my talk, I basically talk about Navy involvement, uh, what about the Air Force? You'd expect the Air Force to be involved. And I have my reasons for believing the Air Force is involved, but uh, I can't go into any detail. And, and most of the what's come out uh, for public consumption is the Navy's involvement. So you know, I'll just have to stick with that. Uh, I didn't quite get the question. You said it, it, since Project Blue Book continue, and actually Project Blue Book, as a, as as a named Project Blue Book, didn't continue. It's just that other programs were set up uh, with different names all over the place. So, and what was the second part of your question? Oh, has Project Stargate, the remote viewing uh, program, continued on? Uh, well, if it has, you wouldn't hear of it. <laughs> That's all I can say. Oh, well, the question is about. Uh, the confusing messages that come out from the public affairs office in the Pentagon, who don't have the clearances to know exactly what's going on in ATIP or following programs, you know, is that uh, clarification? Is there going to be any clarification of that? For example, when Lou Elizondo described his position, uh, <clears throat> uh, at one point uh, the Pentagon said, "Well, we don't know that he was involved in this program, or, or there even was a UFO or that ATIP was involved with UFOs." And, and so that caused a lot of uh, you know, problems for Lou Elizondo, who was an absolute hero. Uh, if I could give you a list of stuff he's done in the intelligence world, you'd know what a hero he was. And then they changed their mind and, and originally said that the videotapes of the F-18 didn't really come out of uh, the Pentagon or they weren't officially approved for release. And then they changed their mind and say, okay, yeah, he was in the program. And then they, it goes back, it's just the clarification is, is not coming forward very cleanly. And so there's a lot of work behind the scenes that say, you know, as long as the story out there is so confused, that might be good for some people to get this off the radar, but you know, it's not right. And so TTSA and my colleagues are doing a lot behind the scenes, uh, speaking to people to try to clean up so they get a nice clean statement. They finally came out with a clean statement to say, yeah, these videos are official. And what's in the videos really is unidentified. So we're making progress, but there's a lot more clarification that could and I think will come because now that the profile is so high, they're drowning in FOIA requests and uh, having to deal with them and s sends them off into the bowels of the Pentagon and the intelligence community to try to get some answers, good luck. So anyway, uh, I think in a matter of time, things will get clarified, but it's really a slow process and poor Lou Alzandra has really been suffering under it, so I've got to say. He's repeating a well-known actually was from a presentation that Ben Rich, who was head of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, <clears throat> gave shortly before his death to an engineering group uh, at, at, at some university in Southern California. <clears throat> and he was talking about all the advances in aerospace and how he developed stealth and so on. And as he got toward the end of his uh, set of slides, he ended up with a slide of what looks like an ET craft taking off into the stars. And so uh, Jan Harzen, who's actually director of MUFON, actually, after the talk was over, cornered him and said, well, you know, is this, what, what can you tell me? Do you guys really have all this going together? And, and so in, I guess maybe it was even in his talk, he said, you know, we now have the technology to uh, take ET home and so on. And so a lot of questions, in fact, by me and everybody in this field, you know, was he exaggerating? Was he really trying to tell us something? Or is he just generating interest in the future? And so whether what he was saying, you know, we have the technology to take ET home and it's not as hard as you would think it would be, statements like that, coming from a guy who's head of the skunk work, 
really hard to discount it. On the other hand, as we go digging for evidence, you know, people's skunk works. I mean, I've had contracts with skunk works, and we keep digging. Um, really can't find out why he said that. So either it was somewhat of an exaggeration and just kind of a blueprint for the future, or it is so buried that even people you, who you think would know uh, don't know. So I don't know the answer to that question. How should I take Ben Rich's comments seriously or not? Um, I just you know, keep digging on the off chance that he might have been telling it like it is. Uh, but you know, until I find data, or my colleagues find data, uh, it just, again, is one of those things in the gray box on the shelf. Do we know of anything the Russians are doing comparable to what you're presenting? Oh, they are looking like mad at the whole subject area, just like we are. Okay. I think I showed one slide, which was the 1991 report that's that thick of all the things they were trying to figure out. I mean, both the US and the Russians have a similar problem, and that is that UFOs have come over our nuclear missile silos and turned them off so that we can't launch. Well, it turns out there's a case in Russia, which is even worse than that. UFO came over, and the missile silo got turned on and started the launch code sequence. And they couldn't, they couldn't turn it off. They couldn't control it. They thought they were about ready to start World War III. And when it got up to sort of the last element of the launch, it stopped. They took that thing apart, nut by bolt, to try to figure out how this could even happen in principle. And uh, you know, similarly, in our case, uh, all the contractors who built all the control equipment were called in to figure out how this could even happen in principle. So yes, the Russians are concerned, just like we're concerned, because they're gathering data, just like we're gathering data. They have evidence, just like we have evidence. They have their teams, their ATIP teams, just like we have our ATIP teams. So <clears throat> they have less openness. I mean, TTSA is really kind of out in the front of being relatively open about what's going on. Um, I have not seen that in the Soviet Union. But you can be sure that they're involved just as we're involved. And this is a question about something that's been floating around uh, on the internet about something magical happening in, in Antarctica, and Senator Kerry uh, went to investigate it, and other things, uh, some astronauts and so on. I've not been able to tell, I, I don't have any evidence, I don't have any opinion, because I base my opinions only on what I can verify, and so I've not seen any actual evidence of some strange ET or Nazi or whatever thing going on in Antarctica. So to me, I, I have it in my file about conspiracy theories uh, that, that I'm not accepting as, as worth spending any time thinking about. I don't actually have any data, so I, I don't have an opinion. I, I only follow the data. This is a question about the Wilson documents uh, that apparently got leaked on the internet. Uh, Admiral Wilson, who was one of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, interviewed by my senior scientist colleague, uh, Eric Davis. <clears throat> Since it discusses uh, potentially ongoing programs, uh, I have no comment. This is a question about uh, discussion. In fact, I, I guess I even mentioned it on an interview with George Knapp about a document uh, leaking that verified that there were, in fact, crash retrievals. Um, I know it's out there on the internet someplace, uh, I'm not sure where, and um, so I don't know where you could go look for it. Um, yeah. And the question was, uh, when, I, when I had uh, Richard Doty as a consultant, uh, you know, some years ago, was that part of the ATIP program? No, this was on another program before ATIP. Uh, this is a question about Dan Sherman's book, uh, 
what is it called, above black or some, something like that, about his experiences being involved with uh, ET communication as part of a super secret program and so on. I don't have any evidence for it. I don't have any opinion for it, of it. Uh, some of what was described didn't quite gel with things I knew about uh, in the general, quote, psychic realm of government investigation. So I've been kind of skeptical, but you know, can I say for sure or not for sure? Was there something to that? I, I have no way of judging. Her question has to do with the fact that I mentioned under the ultra-terrestrial hypothesis that I had formed that uh, you know, maybe, maybe there's some group out there that in fact has been successful in reverse engineering uh, or even inventing from scratch those kinds of exotic craft. Well, it's got to be on the table as an option, as a possibility. My point in, in, in bringing it up in that paper was to say, okay, well, if that's a possibility, what would be the clues that we could find out there? You know. I mean, if somebody's building really magical craft, they still have to order their nuts and bolts from Home Depot or something. You know, it should be possible to follow some lines and so on. So that, that, was, uh, that was an example, uh, one example of, okay, if that's an option, if that's a possibility, how would we be able to find out? What investigatory tools should we use? What paths should we follow to see if we can find evidence for that? I can't rule out the possibility that you know, some terrestrial or organization, who knows, back in the Middle Ages, accidentally dis you know, discovered anti-gravity or something. And now they're off uh, in some you know, mountain hideout in the Himalayas or something, you know, building these craft. You know. So you can't, you can't uh, I'm not ready to rule out anything. I'm also, I want you to know that you know that sounds like my mind is so open, my brains are falling out. The truth of the matter is I, 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 I hold, I'm, I'm very skeptical. I don't, because just knowing the physics, I can't imagine that somebody has done that purely ground up. And I have yet to see evidence in the official literature that I'm exposed to, even at high levels, that successful reverse engineering has occurred. So all that just stays in my gray box at this point. Well, this is a question about one of the things that's floating out, uh, and in fact, I even know the program you're talking about, that Nixon left some secret document when he left uh, talking about UFOs or ETs or what he knew or whatever, and that document has not been found. You know, could remote viewers be used to find uh, the document and so on? I don't know what to make of that, uh, whether there's any validity to the story. Uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, it's difficult for remote viewers to find hidden things. You can give the coordinates and they can get there, but it's like they're dropped in on a parachute and they have no idea where they are. But when you do it the other way, and that is, we'll tell you exactly what we're looking for, can you find it? That's a much tougher tougher avenue with remote viewing. It has worked. In fact, Jimmy Carter revealed a result that we thought we were told would never be revealed, and that is uh, a Soviet plane was being flown out of uh, uh, Libya uh, to be turned over to us, and apparently the pilot got cold feet. He said, well, you know, the KGB is going to hunt me down the rest of my life. So he just bailed out, just changed his mind, and let it crash somewhere in Africa, somewhere in Africa, when it ran out of fuel. And nobody could find it with the satellites because it crashed in the jungle canopy, likely, and so the satellites couldn't find it. So when things get really tough, Stan Turner, who was Carter's head of CIA, came to us, said, can your, quote, remote viewers find this plane. We want to find it before the Russians do. And so we put two of our best remote viewers on it, one from the Air Force, one from our own SRI, and they describe where it was and put an X on a map, which was within two miles. And this is over hundreds of thousands of square miles on a map within two miles of where the plane was in the jungle. So the CIA folks could run in and get the plane, which we got. 
And so that was a case of a successful finding something that was hidden. We were told that that would never be revealed. But then after Carter was out of office, he was talking to a group in, uh, at a university in Georgia. And uh, somebody said, what do you think is kind of weird and strange happened while you were president? And he said, yeah, you know, a Soviet bomber went down in Africa. And we had to turn to psychics to find it. And <laughs> he's actually, uh, his, his, there's a videotaped interview of him uh, actually describing that event. So but anyway, finding <laughs> stuff. Especially you're going to use your resource to find something that just comes out of a conspiracy theory it may not even be true. You know, we just don't go there. Thanks. Thank All right, Donna. I'm sure I told a lot more than I should have. No, no, no. All right. I hope we can. I hope we can edit this. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I ha I have one more final question for you. The last time I heard your name on the internet. Stephen Greer was pitching his movie that's coming out, and he said that you had told him that there were some anti-gravity or anti-energy anti-energy devices or something, and he had asked you why he didn't make them public, and you said that they would murder your kids and your wife, and probably you, if, <laughs> if you said, why did you say that? <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Most of, I mean, it really, uh, really ruins my uh, appreciation for the media in general, because most times when I find something in there about me, <laughs> it's not true. So I'm wondering, is that the case with everything I'm reading here? Or anyway? anyway, no, I did not tell. Uh, Greer, Steve Greer, that if anything were released, if I were to release anything, I and my family would be murdered. Never said it. Never even thought it. So, there you go. <laughs> Thank, thanks for clearing that up. <laughs>